So here's some uh, traditional motivations from a biological perspective. So as you guys were saying, uh, maybe we want to preserve large, well-functioning ecosystems. That sounds like a good idea. So all the energy, materials, movement can, can proceed as they historically have. As you guys also said, maybe we want to preserve rare assemblages of critters, so biodiversity. And then also, as you guys said, maybe we want to preserve an individual, maybe an endangered species or something, or an economically important species. So we can do the ecosystem level, the, the community level, or the organismal population level. That's from the biological perspective. From the practical perspective, this is, we usually don't do what I just said. That rarely, if ever, happens in the, in the grand scheme of things. This is typically why we have a protected area where we have it. It's because the land is cheap, and we can get it. Nobody, nobody else wants it. One, two. Um, it might, as you guys also identified, it might aesthetically look really cool. It might have these beautiful vistas. How do we get the Grand Canyon? Well, we got the Grand Canyon because we had some artists come out and do these, you know, these these. Bierstadt and all these guys did these great, incredible paintings of the Grand Canyon, and they shipped those canvases back to Washington, D.C., and they exhibited them in Washington, D.C. And these folks that could never, or that would never, get on a train and travel for what at the time was a, perhaps a week's long journey out to the Arizona Territory at the time, those folks still said, wow, we should save this. They weren't talking about the ecological dynamic. They weren't talking about condors or kaibab squirrels or the value for Native American heritage or anything like that, they were saying, this place looks awesome. Right? So scenic beauty is a very powerful motivator, especially for us in the States. Uh, next, another very common way, this is very common in California, for example, is we have this whole area we want to preserve, but the developer wants to put a bunch of houses on here. So um, why don't you let me put these houses on most of this, and I'll give you a little postage stamp. And then usually people say, OK. That's good. And so it's set aside because the larger area had some target use that people wanted to use. And this was sort of a, a, a you know, throw a little bone to the environmentalist type folks. And then uh, increasingly, this fourth one is becoming more important. Whether it ultimately becomes really important or not, we'll see. But it's what a lot of people talk about now particularly in the context of climate change. So let's set aside this area because we have some bad things happening due to practices elsewhere, and we want to create a space where, where that function, that organism, that whatever can persist. So for example, we might have an area that's going to become too dry for this animal to live in. So we might go to an adjacent area that's going to be wetter or, or remain more wet compared to the other sites, and set that aside specifically so that we can mitigate the, the loss of that habitat for that organism elsewhere, something like that. Cool? Questions? Uh, you don't have to write all these down, but I want you to look at these. So these are, I've lifted these from a couple different sites, but these are objectives for protected areas. What are we hoping to do with protected areas? And, and the, these include things like conduct scientific research, preserve wilderness, preserve species and genetic, genetic level diversity, maintain ecosystem services, preserve local nature, uh, promote tourism and recreation, educate, develop sustainable resource, restore ecological function, maintain eco cultural traditions. What? Are you crazy? Well, maybe I would say, are you high? But depending on the vote today, maybe people will be high. But <laughs> the point is, um, that's insane. That's an incredibly high bar to create a site that's gonna be a great recreational opportunity and a great research site and a great site where, where people can practice their traditional practices and, 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 right? It might sound great. This is the classic UN approach to doing stuff. Let's have everybody together, what do you guys want? Let's put it all together. It gets very difficult to achieve that when we have all of these chefs in the kitchen, right? And it's not that any one of these things is bad. It's not that we shouldn't Shouldn't want to have that happen, but in a pr very practical sense, the constraints, right? To preserve wilderness, is that the same as having a zip line through it? No, but maybe that's a really popular eco or, you know, tourism thing. And, and we can just go through the list. So, um, so having these types of objectives, which is increasingly what you have to do to get these types of protected areas permitted or approved or funded or whatever, 
it makes it very logistically difficult to achieve any of those. So that, that's a reality of our time. Um, here, here are some, so here, this is now practical. This is all from my experience. But this is examples of how we go about picking, it, uh, picking a site um, and what we might use to decide we're going to put, we have enough money to make a 100 square hectare or 100 hectare park. Where are we going to put it? These are some of the things you might go through. Number one is we care about a particular taxon. So a classic thing there would be so-called IBAs, important bird areas. These are where there's a lot of birds. That's it. So if you like birds, let's find an area, an IBA. So, that, so that's one, one approach. Another approach is um, uh, uh, several different taxa, several different groups. And that would be something like KBAs, or key biodiversity areas, another designation of areas. Uh, taxonomic rarity, or endemism. Uh, the Worldwide uh, Fund for Nature has an Amazon Regional Protection Area Program, and that specifically is designed to protect things that only exist in the Amazon Basin. So that would be an approach where people are saying, hey, if, if there's a lot of things that exist only here, that's going to be a justification for us putting our protected area there. Uh, next, we could talk about representativeness. So we want to make an area that has a mountain peak and a desert valley and a river and a grassland, you know, that kind of stuff. And so a great example of this would be California's uh, marine, are, are, are just a uh, redo of our marine network of protected areas created under the Marine Life Protection Act uh, over the last decade or so. We might want to say, hey, let's put it where we really care about one specific biome. And so that a classic one there would be Ramsar sites. Hey, here's a wetland. We want to preserve wetlands. There's wetland. Boom, put our site on the wetland. And then um, there is also things like special arrangements where we might be worried about connectivity or heterogeneity. And that's a great example of that is here in Ventura County, our wildlife uh, we have a wildlife corridor overlay to our development. And if you want to put a house in that area, there's extra things you have to do. You, you can't put a fence that blocks a coyote. You can't have lights that are shining out into the open space if you're in that, if you're in that zone. So, so those are all different ways, e ecological reasons, to put a protected area where we, where we do. OK? All right. Then we can talk about sociological reasons why we want to put a protected area in a specific spot. We might want to pres pres uh, provision some ecosystem services. So we want to get some benefit, like flood protection or something like that. So OK, we're going to pick an area that has a high degree of flood protection. And uh, those of you guys going to Costa Rica, you'll probably hear about um, their provisioning ecosystem services plan. Have you guys already talked about that in Dr. Rodriguez's class? Or maybe you'll talk about it when you, when you go down there. Um, OK, so or, or we're worried about what humans are doing right now. So humans are chopping down the forest. Humans are putting in gold mines, whatever. And that's leading to endangerment of critters or assemblages or whatever. And so that would be this idea of hotspots. Has Dr. Steele talked to you guys about hotspots yet? OK, right. So, so, that, so that idea would be trying to um, avoid a, a bad outcome, a, an immediate threat. Again, as you guys mentioned before, aesthetics or recreation. Hey, let's set aside this area because this is a great place to ride our mountain bike, or this is a great place to commune with God, or whatever the case may be. And so that example of that would be um, national parks and the Grand Canyon, perhaps the classic, and Yosemite, perhaps the classics of those. Resource extraction. Hey, there, here's an area where we can pull out these, uh, this resource, classically timber. So we're going we're gonna, to, uh, so, so what's the slogan on US forests? You guys know when you drive into a US forest? Land of many, Land of many uses. The U.S. forest doesn't say, back the hell off, this is protected. It says, land of many uses. So yes, you can go camping there, super cool. Yes, you can go hiking there, super cool. But also, it's a place to chop the trees down. And so, so that could be a, a, a reason to um, locate a protected area in a specific spot. And then, as we said before, it's the area that we can get because there's cheap. And, and something like Ormond Beach is a classic example of that, our Ormond Beach wetland restoration project, which um, originally, the wetlands were much more expansive, but those other places were developed. So we, we're saving Ormond primarily because that's what's left over. 
And then this is more of a conceptual one. Nobody's actually done this yet, but there's there's um, a lot of people get excited. A lot, a lot of nerdy people like me get very excited to think about this, which is um, because we extract increasingly resource fish fisheries takes track uh, mobile fronts. So the moving of of productivity fronts, the moving of gyres across the ocean. In theory, we could use satellite technology now to to make a mobile protected <laughs> area. And so you could see something like that. Here are some examples of these things. So normally I show you guys videos, but I think you guys are all totally burnt out. I think you guys are, are uh, you guys look like you're dragging. So we'll just, we'll skip through this. But, but for example, um, here's an, some examples of single species conservation. So we established these protected areas for one or, or a very few number of species. So Kenai uh, National Wildlife Refuge established for salmon and grizzlies. The National Bison Range uh, established for bison, right? Wow, that's, that's, that's really a hard one to figure that one out. Um, and then things like Arantis and Matagora for storks and migratory birds. Here's some examples of cheap or unused land. And so that would be uh, John Heinz over here, uh, the National Wildlife Reserve on the left one that was established in the 60s. That's what it looks like, right? A bunch of uh, freeways and stuff going through it. Again, well, let's put it there, <laughs> right? Let's put the, the protected area right there. Why? It's cheap, skanky, nasty land. Let's do it there, right? So there's one. Uh, Eufaula in Georgia and uh, Noxaby. These ones were areas that were heavily impacted in the uh, Dust Bowl and were screwed up agricultural land. If you look at those landscapes now, you wouldn't necessarily know that. So they've been restored. Um, and, but they were originally obtained because they were messed up land and nobody wanted them. Uh, aesthetics and recreation. So here's uh, somebody jumping over the Grand Canyon. I don't know why I used that picture, but apparently I thought that was funny years ago when I put this together. Um, so again, things that look great, Monument Valley, Yosemite, all that kind of good stuff. Next, do these things work? Okay, so we talked about what, what protected area areas are, some examples of them. Now let's talk about do they actually do, they actually do what, we're supposed, what we're hoping they do. Cool? Questions about the stuff we just, we just went over? Okay. So the idea is, this is a conservation, well, I mean, again, as we've talked about, some of these could be cultural, cultural, cons oh, it's okay, I thought, man, is that, is that, my, is that my video going on? Uh, so, so as we've discussed, they can be cultural uh, preservation motivation uh, as well, but for us, let's talk about the, for the rest, let's talk about the ecological values of them, okay? And so here's a, a picture I like a lot uh, from a few years ago on National Geographic, and we're looking at the uh, Grand Canyon, and what do you see on the right? Smokestacks. Smokestacks. That's, a, that's a, the Navajo coal generation power plant. That uh, things have changed, things have gotten better, but at the time, um, more than 200 days a year, in some cases it was more than 300 days a year, you could not see from one side of the Grand Canyon to the other, because there was so much smog in the air, <coughs> because of this stuff. Why? Because LA needs power. So if the Grand Canyon, perhaps you know, one of the classic jewels of our protected area network in the US, has a coal-fired power plant there, is that, what is protected? Is that really protected? So the question here is, um, do these guys foster conservation? We see the picture on the bottom increasingly so this is a, a lady that's gotten out of her car in the Great Smoky Mountains and walked up to these bucks that are bucking. That is, uh, there's a technical term for that, it's called stupid. She could easily die right there if one of these guys spins and runs into her and gore cuts open her belly and she'd bleed to death right there, like no problem. But she's got her Instamatic camera, so you know, she's gonna get the photo. Uh, what was it, this summer, Oh, where's my, uh, my wife was sending something around. Um, I think it was in Yellowstone, and these tourists came up and said, oh, there's a little baby, uh, I think it was bison, little bison. Yeah. Oh my God, the mom left it. Picked it up, put it in their car, drove it to the ranger station. <laughs> like, the mom left it. The dude's like, what? What are you talking about? So they took it out, and then uh, unfortunately the baby died, because it was separated from his mom, and they couldn't get him going. Did they have to kill it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the point is, is this really protection? 
when you have people that are going in and, and engaging with wildlife, or you know, the classic one is they walk up, hey, there's a grizzly bear. I'm going to take a picture of the grizzly bear, right? And then they get eaten, and then people <laughs> get all angry. Um, on the right is an image from Everglades National Park. Again, National Park. A couple things there. One, the water looks pea soup green. That's not how it's supposed to look. So that's telling us we have some eutrophication problems, some nutrient runoff problems, some, some water quality problems. And then they look like they're going kind of fast. On the left, which you see on that picture, is it where the boat uh, wake is, it looks like black with some white carved out of it. That's seagrass, that's, that's subtidal vegetation. And those lines are caused from, the technical term is jackasses, driving over, grounding their boat up on the beach. So the propeller is going through and chewing up, essentially ripping up the vegetation. And so it's completely chewed up because you, you gotta be up on coke or drinking wine or something to drive your giant boat really fast around there, right? Otherwise you're not cool. So that's a huge impact to the resource. Is that protected? Is that really being protected if this is the routine goings on there? On the upper uh, left, is um, ATR um, off-road vehicle tracks through, again, an area that's supposed to be preserved, right? So all that carved up is, is impact. So again, what are we really protecting here? It's fine to say we've set aside this area, but is it really conveying biologic or, um, ecological value? So here's, here are some things we can use. Here's some questions you guys can ask to say, hey, is this particular unit serving a conservation function. So first, adequacy. Next, representativeness or representability. Next, resiliency. And lastly, connectivity. So adequacy means, okay, we want to do something. We want to say, say uh, have enough habitat for our endangered bird to live. Does this area cover the place where the bird you know, can live? Is, is, is it enough? to help that, that organism or that function achieve, uh, do what it's gonna do. Representability, is it, is it, is it really including all the, the elements that we need it to include? Resiliency, and this is an increase, this is a big buzzword. And people now, people now say, oh, resiliency is such an old word. We need to use like stability or other. But the, the concept is the same, which is when we have a perturbation, when we have a wildfire, when we have a hurricane, when we have a whatever, does the system, can the system on its own recover, respond? Or does it just become a sea of invasive species? Do we lose our focal critters? So resiliency is increasingly a big worry of folks in our era of climate change in particular. And then fourthly, how does our, our unit, is there any exchange with other units? So genetic exchange, uh, reproduction, mates going back and forth, that kind of stuff. So adequacy, representability, resiliency, and connectivity. The first question, as I mentioned, protected areas, I think most conservation biologists would say that protected areas are a cornerstone of conservation work. So do they do that? In general, they seem to be doing a good job within their boundaries. It's not clear if they're working outside of their boundaries. Number one. Number two, are we creating so-called paper parks? Meaning, now this could be a literal paper park as we've discussed in the context of the World Database of Protected Areas, where it says something is protected, or, or somebody said somewhere, or a legislation was passed, or something that said, this area is protected but it has not changed any of the behavior or activities in that area. So yes, it is a park, quote unquote, but it doesn't function as a park. There's no enforcement, there's no, there's no uh, change of management, et cetera. Typically our protected, protected areas are underfunded and they are um, oftentimes not supported by uh, different local power sources. And so it makes the actual protection uh, a huge challenge. We'll see some examples of that in a second. And then 
A third important cr critique of protected areas is that they're for uh, you wealthy Americans. They're for the elite. That they're really a way to exclude poor folks, exclude indigenous folks from the land or sea. And this has become a huge issue in the last 10, 15 years. And in fact, what we didn't have time to talk about, and we don't have time to talk about today, but some of the addendums and some of the modifications of the Convention on Biological Diversity address this very specific thing. Um, and so basically our, our, the, question, the concern there is that protected areas are resourced, uh, are resourced to um, essentially exclude the disenfranchised folks from their traditional resources. Maybe that's salmon fishing, maybe that's whaling, maybe that's timber extraction, whatever. Okay, so let's see, do these things work? Here's, so a couple of you guys, I'm wearing my Hawaii shirt. A couple of you guys went with us to Hawaii a couple weeks ago with our coastal marine management class. Um, this is, so we started the trip off in Waikiki. We didn't quite, quite go this far, we slept on the beach because we were poor, but that's another story. <laughs> Um, so the Waikiki is to the left, this is on the island of Oahu, Waikiki is to the left, this is Diamond Head, this extinct volcano, the iconic view when you see a picture of Waikiki Beach, you'll see that. And what I'm showing you here is uh, fish biomass. So this is the number of fish and then and how big they are and then we've added them up. So the larger the circle, or so, so first the, the dot is where we recorded, people surveyed fish, and then the larger the circle, the more fish were there, okay? What we're looking down is uh, we see two squares, one here and then one here. And so again, here's the beach. So this is in the water. This is in the coral reef setting, tropical uh, reef setting. And uh, do you guys see any pattern to the, to the dots? Larger ones are within the square. Yeah. Yeah, there's bigger ones inside versus outside the square. This is a protected area that's around all the time. This is a protected area that's around for some of the year and then, it's, and then you can fish in it for some of the year. The area outside of this, you can fish the year, uh, in all year round. So it looks like where people extract the fewest amount of fish, that's where there's more fish. Rocket science, I know, it's very complex. Okay, so there's some evidence from Hawaii. Now this is, so people look at this and they go, hey, let's pat ourselves on the back. That's great, right? This Waikiki MLCD is, is great. Look how, many, look how many fish we have. This is the reality. So this is, this is fish biomass from different areas um, in um, uh, Hawaii. And this is looking at a much larger swath of the Hawaiian Islands. And here we're talking about the different types of fish. And what we see is, so this is a marine protected area in blue. Red is area that is not protected. Red is area where anybody can, uh, you know, extract fish, let's say, from. And so what we see is everywhere we, and so the, the, and we're now we're breaking it down based on the uh, trophic group. So we have primary herbivore, or primary consumer, secondary consumer, and then the apex predator category. So this, there's, there's multiple potential species in each of these categories. What you see is everywhere where we have a marine protected area, there's more fish. But the effect is variable, right? It depends on, on what, what critters. So in some cases, we see, um, you know, it's better. In this case, we see about 66% more biomass on average. In other critters, we see, you know, a, you know almost 200% increase. But then with the things we most like to eat, the big sharks and the big, the big tasty things, huge impact, right? That, that we're potentially, or, you know, orders of magnitude more of these guys. Uh, so, so these protected areas really can have a big impact and have impacts throughout the ecosystem. Okay, do we have paper parks? This is, this is our project in Turkey. So on the left is, a, so I used to leave Consbio every semester because I had to go to Turkey every semester. So I do these quick trips. So a lot of those, a lot of those trips, I, I made podcasts. So if you guys go to our, my iTunes U site, you can see all these old 
not old. I mean, they're, they're old, but I think they'd be really interesting to you guys. They're made primarily for you guys, for my conservation biology classes. So I, I did snippets of things getting arrested by the army and stuff like that um, and, and talk about what they mean for, for conservation stuff. So one of the projects, one of my main projects there was I, I'm in charge of our restoration, wetland restoration projects in eastern Turkey. And on the left is a lake, Lake Kujuk. And this was my effort to see if we could exclude, in this case, herbivores from small areas. Areas, like each little parcel is maybe about three quarters the size of this room. So not big chunks. And this, this is a large lake. This is a, if you walked around the whole of the lake, it's like seven miles. This is a large lake. So we're talking about small areas here. And government supported us at the time. It's a whole other story. But government supported us. We put up these things. The local villagers came and cut them down, even though we talked to the villagers. Yo, yo, yo. Does this sound good to you? Yeah, it sounds great. All right, great. Sounds good. And then I go away, come back, everything's cut open. So what you're looking at there, you can see the lake in the foreground. Here is, here is some of my bob wire fence, and here has been cut, right? So it's been cut. And this is all uh, cattle tracks and maybe some goats too. And so they've all come and eaten all my, my protected wetland plants. And so, um, so we go, so in this case, like, what's up? We go talk to the government. Okay, we're gonna give you money for guards. So the government pays some folks from the local village to spend all their days just walking around this area, making sure no one, no one cuts our, our, little, our little experiment, right? To see if this is gonna be a useful way to talk about protecting more resources. In this case, what we're trying to do is trying to make more vegetation, more vegetation, more birds in the, in the lake, more birds in the lake, more ecotourists, then more ecotourists stay in the, village or in the village. In the case of Turkey, which many developing countries, the local people don't get the benefit. It's some big international tourism company and this and that. In this case, we built specific places inside the village where you guys could go travel to and stay and hire the local ladies to cook food for you, hire the local guides to take you around, and you know, cool stuff like that. So they actually get a direct, tangible economic signal that having this more healthy wetland area is good for them. And so they're all totally down with it. They're all great, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and we come out, and it's, and it's like this again. And I'm saying, what the heck, man? Like, what's up? So then we're going, that's my colleague, uh, and he's talking to the guy in red, who's one of the guards. And he says, what's up? And the guy says, oh, well, you know, the um, cattle cut the fence. Really? The cattle cut sh stranded steel? Well, you know, I didn't know cattle were, had prehensile thumbs. Well, you know, actually, well, what actually happened was uh, my brother hurt his back. I had to go do some stuff. And, and then we just go on and on and on, right? All these excuses. Basically, these guys wanted to get paid and not do anything. So, and this is actually a Ramsar site. So we got this area declared a Ramsar site. So this is supposed to be a protected area. This is supposed to be an area where we encourage the conservation of this resource. Is it really? Or is it just on paper? So we go to do the monitoring. We propose to the government, hey, you should give us a contract to do the annual monitoring for this for this project, since we created it, and it's all of our data that provided to you. Uh, yeah, actually, you know what? My cousin, my cousin uh, wants a job. So we're actually gonna give the contract to our cousin who's a thousand miles away. He'll do it. He'll do the, he'll do the annual monitoring for this protected area site. Really? Does your cousin know anything about wetlands? It, it's okay, he's, you know, he's my cousin. Really? Okay. No report, no report, no report. Phone call, hey, uh, can you guys send us all your data for what's going on with the wetland? What, right? So is that really a protected area, right? And so this goes on all the time. And so the term again is paper parks and we have to be really critical. And just because something says it's a protected area, it may not be doing what it's supposed to be doing. It may not be achieving the conservation goals. So when we say, is it doing what it's supposed to be doing? We have to first ask, was it even possible for it to do? Did we even um, provide the resources or the, or the political structure to do that? This is this famous photo from this National Geographic photographer. This is the uh, Gorilla Massacre um, from 2007. Uh, the guy that did it is this bastard over here, this, this guy, Warlord. 
So this is, um, right. So this is what goes on around most of the world. Civil war, rebels fighting, boom, 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 boom. The area where the guerrillas are, big protected area, lots of resources there, right? So in this case, what you see on the right, right here, this is a, a mule train, but instead of people, instead of animals walking, it's humans walking. Poor folks in, um, in camps, in refugee camps, are basic, they don't have any choice. They don't have any place to boil their water for their kids or whatever. So their option is to go work for these uh, people. And so th what they're doing is they're going and they're illegally harvesting timber from the forest where the, the gorilla, the, where the gorilla habitat is. And they take that wood and they essentially turn it into charcoal and then that becomes fuel that then the warlords can sell to the camp, to people in the camp to, to cook food because they don't have they don't have cooking fuel and that kind of stuff, right? The picture on the lower left are some of the guards that stopped one of these one of these trains and arrested these folks, but they're poor folks, right? So that lady's begging him to let her go. The guy on the right is the one that was fostering this, right? He was, and, and he's, he's normally he's in fatigues. He wants to be, at the time we take this photo, he wanted to be seen as just a regular politician. So he would always make sure he'd dress in nice Western wear when the photographers would come around. So he'd look reasonable, right? Paint a good picture for the American and Western media. Um, but the, 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 the guards, and so the, the, the park guards, which you see the picture of the guy right there on the left, um, that were, the, the guards paid almost nothing in many cases, they have their families shot and killed and slaughtered by these guys. So these guards, but even so, the guards are persisting. The guards were persisting. They were sending their families away, and they were sitting there, no salary from the government, almost no bullets, but they were still trying to enforce this protected, the boundaries of this protected area and say this protected area is here for these critters and for, and for the natural resources and the people and all that kind of stuff. So the warlords realized they couldn't, even you know, they're killing these people's families, they were still coming. So they said, you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna go off these gorillas because that's what you guys really care about. So these guys went and specifically slaughtered these gorillas. Normally when you, when you find gorillas dead like this, they're using the illegal wildlife trade. They have their heads cut off, they have their, their hands cut off and they're used for you know, horrible shit like cigarette ashtrays and stuff. These guys are intact. So these guys were slaughtered to make the point, the clear message that, hey, stop screwing with our illegal charcoal extraction um, or we're going to kill the rest of the gorillas. So that's the reality of a lot of folks in protected areas around the world. It's not a, it's not a let's sit in a room and discuss some things nicely. A lot of it is folks desperately poor in very di difficult situations. So when we talk about making these protected areas effective, we really need to be effective in a in, in a real world sense, not some pretty um, things you know, in a safe, protected area. Um, and, and this is a universal challenge in terms of this notion of, protected, uh, of, of making it um, real and worrying about excluding people. So this is one of our, again, this is a, this is a vi village of Drakli, which is around that lake that we work in Turkey. And um, we're saying we're, we want to put in this protected area. And all these guys are here, and they're not very happy. With, well, actually, we have to drink a lot of tea. Drink a lot of tea there. It means more chai. Tea, 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 tea. And then we got to drink more tea, 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 tea. And then we talk. And then we talk, and then we drink more tea, 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 tea. And so this is after about three hours of drinking tea. And finally, we're starting to get to the discussion. So the discussion is, yeah, OK, we get it that you guys want to put some small areas in. But uh, everybody thought that, uh, what would you guess they thought I was doing there? This is Eastern Turkey, this is along the Iranian border, Georgian border. Uh, uh, yeah, so some people are completely convinced I'm CIA. Why would an American come here? And also the people are short, I'm a little tall. They're like, well, that's why I stand out and I'm loud and obnoxious and fat and I'm, I'm look, I look different from most people. So, um, so they think I'm a spy. I can tell you stories about that. But then what else, any other thoughts? I'm there to steal their resources. So a lot of folks completely convinced I work for some American oil company, because the only reason Americans come to the Middle East is to take oil, they think. 
or some of these folks think. And so, and so I'm at the lake because there must be oil under the lake. And so all this notion about putting up fences and stuff, and, and you know, so it, it's really deeply rooted that I'm coming there, or, 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 or folks like us would go to these places because we want something from them. They have a hard time understanding that, hey, we're here doing this so that you guys, especially we to have a lot of projects with women's groups and stuff, that you guys could be empowered, that you guys could make some money for your stuff. And they just like, really? Really? We, we're pretty much convinced that this is a way for you guys to push us off the land or whatever. So that's a very real concern, and it's something we have to deal with all the time. Were you able to convince them? Yes, we were able to convince them. But then, <laughs> but then, uh, yeah, it's a much longer story. So then, then the war started breaking out in um, Syria, and then we have a lot of problems with terrorism where we are with the PKK, which is this Kurdish insurgency group, and then. Um, and then the government is, is uh, I shouldn't say on the recording. <laughs> I'll just say the, the, the government has uh, uh, conservation not a priority for the government at the moment. And uh, so we can talk about that. But yes, some of my assistants have been beaten up by the government, had their heads bashed in. It's, it's kind of a crazy thing. Originally, we went there with the idea that we would do, start, I say, just like I take you guys to New Orleans, I would start taking you guys there. But it, uh, I've never, I never have taken any of you guys there. We have some American students that have met me there, but, but never take you guys there because it's way too sketch, just sanitation-wise and, and personal security-wise. So um, we can talk more about that later. Um, but this notion of exclusionary regimes or ex exclusionary schemes is not just in places like Turkey and the developing world. It's right here as well. So this is from up just north of San Francisco. This is in the Point Reyes National Seashore. This is an area in a, in a protected area in a national park where um, we have traditionally had folks doing oyster farming. And, and this, this, these photos are, and images are from a few years ago. Now these folks have been excluded. And so uh, some people say it was the right thing to exclude them. Other people say that we're moving, removing traditional uses from the land. So we, I don't want to get into that debate right now, but suffice it to say, this stuff happens all over the place. That was sort of the broad, that was sort of the broad high level. Let's look at some actual data. So let's talk about this first one. Are they adequate and representative? So we have a bunch of protected areas in some area. Hey, let's check them out. Are they, are they rocking and rolling? Here's a map from this morning from our American database of protected areas, which is managed by the USGS. And uh, just you, know, you can have a look at it. And basically, the colors represent some form of protected area. If we glance at that, hell yeah, it looks great. Right? There's a whole lot of green or, or different shades on our American land. That's great, right? Woohoo! Here is uh, a, a, a different representation now. Instead of showing the area, just, just the like central, centroid. But um, mostly here we're looking at national parks, national forests, etc. Where are these? Where are these locations? Are these evenly distributed across the U.S.? No. Why not? Well, right. Outside. There were fewer people back then when we started this. Now notice there's a bunch of, if you just glance, it looks like there's a bunch of stuff on the eastern seaboard too, right? There is. But let's have a look at these. Boston National Historic Park, right? Uh, Gettysburg National Military Park, right? Over here, it's Death Valley, it's Zion, it's Grand Canyon. The stuff that we have over here is primarily cultural in, in motivation. It's a, it's a Civil War battleground. It's, a, it's a, where we sign the Declaration of Independence, whatever, right? Which aren't bad things. But there's very, comparatively speaking, the West is where the, is where the, the say, the uh, biological, the natural focused national parks are, right? And that was a consequence that we, we started, our Europeanization of this continent starts here. And so this part is already pretty much all eaten up by the time we get this idea going. And so this is what this is where there was one fewer people, but two where there was a lot of available land. Uh, let's look at the distribution of Ramsar sites. So this is as of this morning. Uh, here over here is I have a map of them. And then here I'm showing you in, in the internal part of the donut graph here is the number of sites. And then the proportion of the total is wrapped around the outside. 
So are Ramsar sites, wetlands of international importance, are they distributed equally around the planet? Maybe. There's been industrialization in China. There's been industrialization in, in the US. Why is Europe so over enriched? Is Europe a huge chunk of land compared to say Asia? But check it out. There's way more in the small territory that is Europe or the small, uh, small region that is Europe as compared to uh, say Asia. Why? Why aren't there more Ramsar sites in Asia? Uh, so, so Greg's comment is, hey, is, is it have to do with a, a few governments versus many? Mm, probably not. Karen? Not a priority. Not a priority. Right. So who did I say was the, who, who were the folks that first started worrying about birds and birds going extinct? Europeans. Right. Europeans, especially Northern Europeans, especially the, the, um, the, the British and those folks, right? So they're the ones that pushed the idea. <laughs> They're the ones that maybe have more converted land to non-natural habitat. So maybe it's more important for them. So there's historical reasons, cultural reasons, political reasons there, right? North America has way more wetlands than Europe. But in terms of Ramsar sites, we don't really bother with Ramsar sites because we have a more powerful protection scheme called the Clean Water Act, U.S. Clean Water Act. Turkey? Our Ramsar site, that's it. That Ramsar quote unquote protection, that's it. It's not as important for us, for some countries it's not as important. Others, it has been. Others, it's a historical reason. But the, it amounts to the distribution of the protection does not map with the resource necessarily, right? There are other motivators that led to the establishment of them. Okay, here's a quick thing. We'll do this. I know you guys are not very interactive. Where does my stuff go? All right, take a quick second. You guys are going to try to guess your answers here. You're going to write down the percentage of these areas that you think are, uh, as of 2009, the areas you think are in some form of protection. I haven't asked Dr. Dr. Steele this, but 100% or uh, extra credit if you guys get them all right. <laughs> I've never had anybody get. Okay, ready? Count three. Last guesses. One, two, three. Booyah. So grasslands and savannas, relatively well protected. Relatively well protected. Mangroves, again, I'm not saying this is, this could be paper parks, but nevertheless, this is, this is in some, within some uh, designation. So we go from you know, a 40 odd percent to, for example, deserts, 10% or so, 11%. By the time we get to forests, uh, boreal forests, we're getting about eight and a half percent. By the time we get to uh, temperate grasslands, which are the grasslands that you and I uh, typically think of as grasslands, it's only 4%. And then importantly, when we talk about marine, a small percentage. Now this has increased in the last couple years. So this, 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 the marine number is the greatest that's changed over the last several years, but still, it's a small fraction. Even though the oceans are the vast majority of the earth, the vast majority of our biological habitat for critters, the largest volume of places to live, a small sliver are set aside. This is, uh, now again, it's, so the distribution of these things, the, the coverage of these protected areas is uneven. So here's a graphic also from 2009 um, that shows that it varies dramatically by country. So some, and here the darker uh, coloration is a higher degree of terrestrial areas in protection, the lighter color less. And so we see very uneven distribution. In some countries, like in the Americas, lots. In much of the rest of the world, not so much. Here's an interesting analysis. So this is coral reefs. Um, this, so this is a, a paper from Science a few years back, and this is where these guys went out and looked at marine protected areas over, over almost a thousand coral reefs. And uh, you can't see you can't see all the graphics here, but basically the colors in each of these areas for Southeast Asia, etc., represents the 
the proportion of the protected areas that are under threat from different sources, from overfishing, from sedimentation, what, what have you. But so here's the network. What these guys did is they found that if they only set aside 5% of, of the total acreage of reefs around the whole planet, that in theory could be enough to, to help conserve coral populations. So we need not necessarily spend a gazillion billion dollars. Maybe it's about making sure that wherever we put these protected areas, it's in a smarter location. They're in a smarter space. And so this purple map, the sim symbolizing all the, the, in the you know, theoretical protected areas we could put in place, that could have tremendous import. So we don't necessarily need a huge amount um, to achieve our targets. Are, are these areas distributed adequately? Classic example, these are some tigers. This is, this is a, a nature photographer that shot these pictures of tigers. So what you're seeing, this is in 2008, um, in a protected area in India. You should never see these two t tigers like this coming together, certainly not in the daytime. And, and this guy happened to be going by and he got these incredible photographs of this tiger fight. What that's saying is the territory, the, the, the area where these tigers are going is too overlapping. So these tigers are fighting because they both want limited territory. So that's saying that the protected areas, yes, it's a protected area for tigers, but it's not big enough. If it were big enough, these guys wouldn't be fighting each other, or these ladies wouldn't be fighting each other in the middle of the day. So very aberrant behavior. So that says that maybe these protected areas aren't distributed adequately. Uh, next, are, are we meeting our management goals with these protected areas? So we're going to run out of time here. I'm just going to I'll jump forward through a couple of these. But here's one example. This is looking at uh, protected areas. This is a study from a few years ago. And, we, and this is on a relative scale. This over here means that um, all, the, all the goals, of, all the conservation goals are rocking and rolling. We got everything. Over here in zero, or at zero, is we met no, zero of the goals, none of the goals. So here is looking at over 2,000 protected areas. What we find is there's an average score of 0 0.525. So on average, we're getting about half of the goals we'd like to get. So are you a glass half full or a glass half empty person, right? So that's better than zero, but not great. And then the, the authors further went down and broke this down into 0 0.33 or less, which is symbolized by this line right here. This seriously constrained, meaning lots of massive problems with this protected area. Uh, 0.66 and higher is what they've classified as uh, relatively sound management and, and doing a good job at, at shooting towards your goals. This part in the middle is what they would classify as uh, seriously defi or significantly deficient in terms of uh, achieving the goals. So the majority of our, or the most common situation is to be deficient in achieving our conservation goals. Karen? Was this line about the areas that you didn't have anything to do with that? Okay, good. So Karen's question is, hey, so maybe some of these parks have only been in, in place for a year. Maybe some have been in place for 10 years. Clearly time is a factor, but with this many sites, that should, that, that should be swamped out, but good, good concern. Um, running out of time, I'll just say that, that socioeconomic status helps with stuff. So here is, here's a little bit of Karen's question. So this area, it, this is a study where folks looked at, um, we put in a, tropic, in, a, in a tropical forest, we put in a protected area, and then we came back at some point in time later. I think this was typically about 20 years later. But, but it's a range of stuff. And here we go. So we looked at the coverage of forests before, and then at the time of the establishment, and then we looked at it now. So if there was no change between the, the extent of forest vegetation, it would be z zero. Everybody with me on that? If it is increased, it's going to be over here. And these are binned. These are binned for, I don't know why they did this way, but they did. So this is, this is the number of protected areas that increased from anywhere from 1 to 10 percent, here 11 to 30, and here 31 to 70. So note they're not even bins. 
And then same thing here, this is lost one to 10% cover, lost 11 to 30% cover, lost 31 to 70% cover. And so, so from this graphic, do protected areas improve forest cover? Yes. Yes, right, yeah, so totally, right? Because the green bars, there's more green bars, the more, more, more sites in the green situation than over here. Importantly, check this out, zero. No change. That's actually probably a conservation success in the real world. Things aren't getting any worse, is what that says, right? Let's look at this. Same question, same study. Here's the, this is sort of, this is an old graphic, so sorry. But this is proportion of all the possible sites, okay? Everybody with me on that? You gotta watch this, because this is, this is, this will be confusing to you. This is a proportion of all the sites. This lower graphic is the acre, is the extent inside the protected area. This area up here is the area adjacent to the park, outside the formal protected area, okay? This is, uh, you know, again, small change, and this is, again, change over time. This is small change, you know, 0 to 10%, 11 to 20, et cetera. So this uh, guy here, this is the amount of land cleared. And this is the change over time. So I'm going to ask you guys, did protected areas help with land clearing? This is outside, the upper block is outside the protected areas. This is inside the protected areas. So my question is, and, and this is the change over time. So my question is, do, does the establishment of, of a tropical forest protected area, uh, is it a beneficial thing for land clearing? Right, right, right. So look outside, look at all this. There's, there's, I don't know what that is, 11% or 19%, something like that, uh, uh, was, was in a, a 11 to 20% cleared category. About the same amount was in 21 to 40% category. Look at this. There's, there's you know, a large chunk that, that was in this um, uh, 81, you know, a large fraction cleared. Here's the median. The most common answer is about, on average, because these are different sized, on average, 41 uh, to 41 to 60% was the most common proportion of land lost here inside the park it was less it was one, zero to ten same thing area burned same thing check it out inside the park the most common category is a small proportion of the land burned outside it was more like 11 to 30 percent was the most common category burned so this does not say that protected areas are perfect but it's saying relative to the areas that aren't protected they're doing better grazing pressure same thing Inside, on average, and this, this would be things like cattle, on average there's grazing inside. Maybe that's not a good thing, but relative to the outside, relative to the country and the constraints at the time, it's actually better to be inside than outside. You guys with me on that? So to say that protected areas work, it doesn't have to be perfect. We're talking about a real world conservation strategy, a real world tool. Same thing with game, same thing with commercial tree populations. Um, we're running out of time. So let's just say really quickly that we need to monitor, as with all of our conservation approaches and conservation tools, we must monitor. If we don't monitor, we don't know what's working and what's not working. And it's very common that people don't pay for monitoring, don't have a program to monitor. And it's left to us, left up to us, our IRA trips, our travels, our senior capstone projects. Right? It's great experience for you guys, but quite frankly, that shouldn't be falling on your shoulders. The park service should be doing it. The, the whoever should be doing it. But a lot of times it's left up to, to us. In, in general, this is what we'd like to have happen. We'd like to have uh, go from one state and then monitoring and, and sort of move through this system of planning, do something different. The system's going to respond. We measure that. We adjust. And we have this constant circling back where we're constantly adjusting. Maybe we need to change our behavior. Maybe we need to allow some fire sometimes. Maybe we need to put out some fire sometimes. Without monitoring, you will not know what to do. And the vast majority of protected areas are not monitored, or at least not monitored adequately. Ideally, we'd like to see uh, well-targeted monitoring with really clear objectives. We want more 
uh, oak trees, right? Something very specific that's very obvious what we should monitor, not leave it up to researchers just to figure it out on their own. Uh, it's very important that, especially with protected area, the protected area tool, there's no such thing as permanently winning, ever. So nothing is ever saved. We only have temporary reprieves. Here's some examples of that. So uh, this is the uh, Escalante Grand Staircase. This is a, a, a national monument that was established. And when this was established, the folks that lived around there, this is in Utah, the folks that lived around there didn't like it. So the mayor of the town said in 2011, in terms of testimony in front of the US Congress, testimony in front of US Congress, most of the folks go here as tourists. So, so the mayor of the town just outside says, I don't see where the, the 1996 designation has brought us, has brought in any jobs for our community. What? That's a strange statement. Here's another statement uh, by another, uh, by a, a congressman. With your support, and this, this is a, a, a congressional committee, with your support in this committee, we can restore the Antiquities Act, which is the, uh, the act that um, allows us to establish national parks and, and things of that nature. Um, so we can restore the Antiquities Act to its intended purpose. Its intended purpose. More importantly, we can restore the power to govern in this country to the people. For Montanans, the 1906 Antiquities Act is something like the Sword of Damocles. Right? So that's a, 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 a existential threat hanging over your head with a sharp sword dangling there. I didn't introduce the Montana Land Sovereignty Act to undermine the intent of the Antiquities Act. Huh. On the contrary, my legislation restores this valuable law to its original intention, preservation of only American archaeological antiquities. That dude clearly is going to vote for marijuana legalization because he is super high already, right? <laughs> That was not the intent. That was but one part of the intent. This is a revisionist history of a very important protected area tool. So if you're not paying attention to these conversations, you will miss what's going on. Uh, we have had everyone from uh, Native American tribe putting out. Has anybody gone on the skywalk in, in uh, the Grand Canyon? This is essentially, you guys know about it? This is essentially this, this, this glass projection out over the Grand Canyon where you can w pay a fee, you can fly up there in a helicopter from Vegas if you're in Vegas, and you can walk out and you essentially look straight down. So it's not for people that have issues with heights because you, you know, look straight down to the bottom of the Grand Canyon. Um, and some people have said that's great, right? This is a, a Native American tribe generating money for themselves. Other people have said that's, that's not what we should be doing with our national parks. We shouldn't be making an extreme adventure for folks that want to do that. Here's a, this is from a few years ago, but here's a map of California state parks that are threatened by various things. And here's, they're added up. Railroad right-of-way, contaminated runoff, impacts from nearby development, road right-of-way, uh, various encroachments, desalination plant, and this is again several years ago. So these areas that are quote unquote protected, are they really protected? You can't simply say they're protected and walk away. Who's in the National Parks class right now? You guys couldn't go to Santa Rosa Island last week because some drug pongas dumped off a bunch of pot out on Santa Rosa and Homeland Security decided we gotta go run the show. So they evacuated everyone, they canceled your class, they canceled our other activities. We couldn't go to our research station because of this drug activity. Is that really protected? If we can have that stuff going on, so I'm not allowed to. I'm not allowed to share with you what exactly happened last week. So, um, so uh, here, this was last week. Eamon Bundy, the guy on the upper right there, and six others. Thank God they're white dudes, because I suspect if they were African American, if they were Latina, they wouldn't have gotten off. But these guys went to a national wildlife refuge, a protected area, took it over with guns trashed the place, disturbed Native American artifacts, things of that nature. And last week, the jury acquitted them of all charges. So they're free. So this picture is one small area they left when they ev evacuated. Does that look like being a good steward of the land? 
is that area really protected? If we can have armed folks walk on in and say, well, this is our land. We can do whatever the hell we want because we got guns. Is it really protected? We have to be always vigilant about these protected areas because it's we put years and years worth of work. We finally get something protected in a way that's that's just and efficacious and everything. And then if we're not paying attention, next year somebody can delete all that, right? And we're not talking about a Super Bowl that we can do another Super Bowl next year and another Super Bowl next year. We're talking about resources that if they go away, they might go away forever. So we have to be eternally vigilant when it comes to protected area establishment. So in summary, to finish up, uh, we talked about the IUCN protected area categories. We talked about these, these six areas, these different six categories, although only a subset of them would we maybe consider rigorously defined. And, uh, you know, yeah, so we talked about that. Uh, we talked about the global distribution of protected areas. We talked about some international conventions and programs. Uh, we talked about Ramsar sites, World Heritage sites, man and biosphere uh, ideas, and the man and biosphere reserve stuff I mentioned as the ones that are probably the best you know, theoretical example, whether we actually do them in practice is another question. But this notion of a core transition and buffer, a great way to integrate humans in the landscape and not like, kick everybody off the land, but yet still achieve conservation values and have ecosystem services supporting those, those uh, communities and settlements. We talked about the biodiversity convention. The current targets, the current targets are the Achi targets, and that is, those are targeted by, 20, by 2020. Terrestrial areas, 17% or greater of land in protection. Marine, 10% or greater in for some form of protection. We talked about the motivation for establishing protected areas, the biological versus the, the real world practical reasons why we put a, a park where we put it. We talked about some examples of, of protected area establishment. And then we, we really quickly, we didn't, we didn't spend a, a huge amount of time, but we talked a little bit about protected area efficiency and effective tool versus paper park versus are these things exclusionary? Are they, are they simply pushing out First Nation peoples and poor folks? Um, and then we, we touched a little bit on, on how efficient networks are. And then uh, we, I did show you guys some evidence that protected areas can work. We talked about the fish biomass in Hawaii and the tropical forests. And then uh, we, we just skimmed over the monitoring needs of protected areas. Cool? Wow, that was a lot. Okay, all right, questions? <laughs>